We'd like to introduce uh, the case of Dr. Whitaker, who's still in practice, an atheist at the time, had nothing to do with God. Uh, but there's a situation that occurred that changed his life, and we'd like you to experience it with him. It was February of 1975. At that time, I was an alcoholic out of control. Uh, I was also using uh, recreation drugs, but primarily alcohol was my drug of choice. And uh, I totally was out of control. And I had a lot of friends in the entertainment business, and Hoyt Axton happened to be one of them. Ringo Starr and a bunch of people. And so they were having a TV special on the West Coast. And so Hoyt had called me and asked me if I would like to go uh, or come out. And I told him, yeah, I'd really love to because I knew there was going to be a lot of booze. I knew there was going to be partying. And while they were doing their special, uh, I was doing my thing. And so after about three or four days out there, I became ill. And uh, by ill, I mean I, I had a severe pain in my abdomen. I flew into Oklahoma City and uh, called a senator friend of mine and told him I had to have a car because I was ill, I was sick. So they sent a car and they took me home and I checked into the hospital at Wadley Hospital in Texarkana in February of 1975. I checked in with electrolytes, which means my potassium, my chlorides, and various chemicals were so far out of balance that uh, they had to give me IVs to build me up. Now, at that time in my life, I was an atheist. Uh, I was a hardcore atheist and uh, was living for myself. And this is where I found myself in 1975 in the hospital, and they took three days and then they operated me and when they operated me I found myself in intensive care I woke up on a respirator which means they were breathing for me uh, I was I couldn't speak but I you know and I had been laying there in a coma and I had heard these people talk about how sick I was and how I was going to die and how I wouldn't get out of the hospital and at that time, my hair was very, very long because I, uh, I just wore my hair long. And I heard one guy say, my, his hair is long. And another guy said, not nearly as long as it's going to be before he gets out of here. And a third voice said, he's not going to get out of here. He's going to die. And after three days, I could breathe on my own. And I remember my doctor, my surgeon, a guy by the name of Donald Duncan. He told me, he says, Don, if you have anything to get right, if you have anything to get signed, you get it done because we're not sure. We're not sure how long you have. So I knew, see, I had a condition that was called acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. You don't live with this disease. Now, you can live with pancreatitis. You can even live with acute pancreatitis. But you do not live with acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. Duncan had told my two sons that I would be dead before morning. They didn't expect me to survive. And, uh, you know, I'm laying there. Now, I, I'm a professed atheist. And when I say a professed atheist, I didn't believe in God. But I was an atheist. Now, see, it's very easy to be an atheist when you're successful. You have worked your way from Oklahoma welfare to being one of the most powerful men in your part of the country, one of the most powerful men in the state of Oklahoma in relationship to political. It's very easy to be an atheist when you have done all of that. Man can sit back and say, I don't need God. What is God? But it's very difficult to be an atheist when you're laying on your deathbed because you begin to think, what if these people are right? See, there had been one man by the name of Ron Short that had stood between me and the gates of hell. One man that had witnessed to me about the love of Jesus for five years before I became ill. One man. And, you know, I would debate him. And I liked him because he did what he said he was going to do. I mean, he was the only one that I saw that professed to be Christian that lived what he said he was going to do. Uh, and so I, I really respected him. I didn't believe what he said, but I respected him. But when I'm laying on my deathbed, 
and knowing that I'm going to die, guess who I thought about? I thought about what if Ron is right? What if there is a heaven and a hell? And so the most immediately, immediately, the most pressing thought in my mind is, how do I get saved? What is saved? What is saved? How do I get saved? And so I sent them for Ron Short. I wanted him to come down uh, because I wanted him to do ever what he had to do. I had no idea. How can a man hanging on a tree in Israel 2,000 years ago, what is that to me? But I knew that he had something that I had to have. And that night, see, I had him go for Ron, but Ron wasn't home. Ron was in Alabama. And so I had him go and send for Ron. And that night was the longest night that I've ever had in my entire life, before or since. And that night is as I would be laying there in bed. As I'm laying there in bed, I would begin to fade away. I would begin to fade away, and as I would fade away, I would begin to go down. It, now, it was like darkness. It was like, it was so, so dark. It was like the very darkness just penetrated into your very, very being. And as I left, and I can tell you I left my body because I remember when I came back into my body. You know, I don't know where I was out of my body. Now there are people that talk about the, the, a light. There are people that talk about floating above. There are people that talk about a feeling of warmth and love. I didn't feel any of that. I felt none of that. I felt untold terror. Untold terror. Because I knew that if I ever went all the way, if I slipped all the way, I would never get back. Now, in my beings of beings, I knew that. And so I fought all night long. They told me later on, I not only pulled the mattress cover off of the mattress, I pulled the mattress up on me because I had to stay. I had to wait. I had to wait till Ron got there. Whatever he had to do, I had to wait. But I would, again, and then I would leave, and I would, I would be going down like a deep, deep, dark terror. Now, my, my skin began to get cold. Now, it's not like cold when you walk out into the air. It's like bone, bone chilling cold in my lower extremities. And you can feel the coldness begin to come up the legs. And again, I would begin to leave. Now, and I would be in that darkness, and I'd be in that void. Uh, and I remember one time entering back in my body, because when I entered my body, it was like, just like that. I felt my body thud, my physical body thud, when I entered back in. Now, I, believe me, believe me, that is the most horrifying, terrifying experience that I've ever encountered. And I fought all night long. And the next morning, somewhere 9, 30, 10 o'clock, in came Ron. And Ron came in and he says, Dr. Whittaker, what do they say is your chances? I said, Ron, they tell me I have none. He says, now's the time. And I said, you're right. I mean, I'd cursed him, I'd spit at him, but now was the time because I had to have whatever he had because I had a short period of time on earth and I didn't know I have any idea when I might make that trip and go all the way. At that time, Ron led me simply in the sinner's prayer. Now, I had no idea what the sinner's prayer was, but I see, I trusted Ron. But he led me in the sinner's prayer and told me that Jesus had died for my sins. He had died for the sins of the world. Uh, I didn't quite understand that. But I knew, you know, he showed me in the Word of God where it said that. Now you have to understand, I'm a man of books. I've spent a big part of my life, 25, 26 years of my life, in books. Uh, in, you know, all types of scientific books. 
uh, chemistry, like I said, degree in chemistry, advanced degrees, uh, all the way out to the medicine doctor to practice medicine, all of these degrees. So he told me, and I believed him because it's in this book, and it was a new book unto me, and it was called the Bible. And so I led, I, 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 I let Ron lead me in the sinner's prayer, and I, I said the sinner's prayer after him, and I can tell you one thing. There was a peace that came over me like I had never known. I'd searched for that peace. I'd searched for it in the bottles, alcohol. I'd searched for it in needles. I'd searched for it in drugs. I'd searched for it with women. I'd searched for it all types of places. But there was no peace in my life. But once I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was no longer afraid. I still believed I was going to die because I knew the condition I had is that you do not survive it. I knew that. I'm a physician. I knew what I had. You did not survive. And he shows me in the Word of God. It says, These signs shall follow those that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I walk around on planet Earth this day taking no insulin, taking no enzymes, eating whatsoever that I might, and God produces in my body every day the correct material for me to function without having to take medication. You know, when you see blind eyes open, you see the cripples walk, you see the leopards cleanse, and you see them with your own eyes, you know, you, you see that, then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, the Bible is true. The prayer of faith, the prayer of salvation, is not some just little prayer. It's the only way to the Father. And that's the only way. Now, all of these people that in the New Age movement that believe that everybody's going to heaven, that you can worship anything, you worship a flea, you can, you can squeeze a tree, uh, you can worship a crystal, you can worship a star. I got news for them. They're not, you know, they're not going. Uh, unless they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because the Word says the only way to the Father is through the Son.